Hi, thanks for joining us for our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. It's Thanksgiving at our house and I'm singing a tune. I'm cooking in the kitchen, it's what I always have to do. I'm raising three crazy kids and feeling twice my age. I'm reading the paper, it's how I disengage. I'm brand new to this family, I'm not all that well known. Could you put down your phones and say hi to Eric, please? Hey. Uh, hey guys, haven't seen you since the wedding, and I'm I'm just really grateful to be a part of this fam. I really like football, but not so much people. We stress about this day because we are dysfunctional. The food is finally ready, but it's exactly 12 o'clock, and, and there's, there's nothing, nothing more, more to do. So I guess we have to talk. So where's the gravy? You know what? There's not gravy really? this year. Why not? Hi, thanks for joining us for our continuing study in the book of Ephesians. Last week, we looked at the believer's new clothes. Tonight, we're going to look at walking like a believer. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your many wonderful blessings. We thank you for your kindness. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus and all that he means to us. May you encourage each of our hearts tonight and lead and teach us through the power of your presence. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great gift of salvation to us. For we give thanks to you in your holy name. Amen. Walking like a believer. Last week we talked about putting on the believer's new clothes. Put off the old man, put on the new man. Now let's see what that looks like. When we put on the new man, there are some things that we should do. And is given to us in Ephesians chapter 5 some practical advice directly relating to walking like a believer. In Ephesians 5 and verse 1, the scripture says, Imitate God in everything you do. And so we're supposed to be followers of God. We're supposed to be imitators of God. And you say, well, how can I do that? Well, <clears throat> when we begin to look 
into the scriptures, we see that Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. The Father and I are one. And so when we look at an illustration that we can follow, obviously it is Jesus. But we can also look into the Old Testament and the New Testament and see many of the characteristic traits of God. But we don't have to do that so much here in this particular circumstance because Paul gives us three ways that we can be like God. So three ways I can be like God. Let's begin. Number one, he says, learn to walk in love. We need to learn to walk in love. God is love. John the Apostle said that. God is love. And you don't even begin to understand love until you know God. Because God is love. And so we need to learn to walk in love. In this passage, in verses 1 and 2 of Ephesians 5, it says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Now, <clears throat> the word therefore, I've told you before, anytime you see the word therefore, you look and see what it's there for. Well, in the previous chapter, as I said, we talked about putting on the new clothes. Putting off the old man, putting on the new man. Begin to walk in his ways. And so we need to be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And so three things here he says <clears throat> about learning to walk in love. And so I ask this question, how do I learn to walk in love? Well, first of all, we build on the right foundation of love. Some people don't build on the right foundation. When they uh, are trying to live their Christian life, they're building it on rules and regulations. They're building it on, on concepts and ideas that they have no scripture validity for. But the scripture says we need to build on the right foundation. We build on the foundation of love. And what is that foundation? I am a child of God. I am a dearly loved child. He loves me. That's the reason he sent Jesus. John 3, 16, for God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son. The Bible says God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the ungodly. It has to be built on a right foundation of love. In Ephesians 3, when we were back there in this great book, uh, Paul said this. He said, I am asking God to give you a gift from the wealth of his glory. I pray that he would give you inner strength and power through his spirit. Then Christ will live in and through faith, in you through faith. And I also ask that love may be the ground. Now, in other words, that's the bottom, the foundation. Love may be the ground into which you sink your roots and on which you have your foundation. He wanted us, even back in chapter 3, to understand this biblical principle of having the right foundation of love. He says, when we begin to do that with all of God's people, you'll be able to understand how wide, long, high, and deep his love really is. So you got to build on this foundation of love, the love that God has given to us as believers in Jesus Christ. So that was the first thing he said. We're dearly beloved children. And as we're dearly loved children, we build on the right foundation of love. Here's the second thing he said. He said, live a life of love. Th that's not a suggestion. That is a commitment. That's a command. He says, live a life of love. That means we make a firm commitment to love. Sometimes you don't feel like it, but love is something that we do. It's not necessarily something that we feel. I often tell folks that emotions are like the caboose on a train. The train sets the example. It makes the commitment. It drives forward. And the feelings come as the engine is driving us what we need to be. So we need to make a firm commitment to love. We need to live a life of love. That's one of the commands that is here. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. But we need to make a commitment to love. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul the Apostle said, 
Be the best in this work of grace in the same way that you're best in everything, such as faith, speech, knowledge, total commitment, and the love that we inspired in you. He says, I'm not giving you an order, but by mentioning the commitment of others, I'm trying to prove the authenticity of your love also. In other words, you've got to make a commitment to love, and that love is an action. It's a verb. It's not just something you feel. It's not just something that you think about or you have a a head knowledge of. It is the way we behave. And so you make a firm commitment to love others. So build on the right foundation of love. Make a firm commitment to love. And then he says this, just as Christ loved us. And so that is following the best example of love. If I want to learn to walk in love, I build on the right foundation, I make a firm commitment, and then I follow the best example that I have of love. In the New Testament, in John chapter 15, Jesus said this, My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. And then he makes a decorative statement, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ made that ultimate sacrifice. He was the best example of how to love people in the entirety of the world. In all of history, Jesus is our greatest example and demonstration of love. And so, how do I learn to walk in love? Build on the right foundation Build on that foundation as a child of God. I am loved by Him. You need to understand I'm loved by Him, and you need to accept that love. You make a firm commitment to love. Demonstrate, prove the authenticity of your love by how you live your life, by what you do. Do you love Jesus? Do you love God? Do you love other people? Do you even love your enemies? You demonstrate it by making a firm commitment to love. And then lastly, Follow the best example of love. And that best example in all of the world, in all of history, is Jesus Christ. So, three ways I can be like God. Number one, learn to walk in love. Number two, learn to walk in holiness. This is a challenge for every believer. It's not something that happens overnight just at the snap of a finger. It's something that takes time for us to process and develop into our lives. There are some people that say, you've got to be holy right away. I got news for you. I wasn't. You weren't. I've never met anyone the moment that they accepted Jesus Christ lived a holy life from that moment forward. Why? Because it's a process we go through. We are becoming more like Jesus Christ, the scripture says. We're not instantly like him. Yes, we're instantly forgiven. Yes, we're instantly have the penalty of sin removed in our lives, but we still don't act like it. We don't live like it. And so here in this passage, he gives us some practical insights in how to walk in holiness. Now follow me with, follow with me on this because this gets into some nitty gritty. Okay, so let's learn to walk in holiness. Paul says, but among you, there must not even be the hint of sexual immorality. Now, the word immorality that we're going to look at in a few minutes in the concept of Scripture is nearly always a reference to sexual immorality. That's the reason the translators added this word sexual there because it always applies to sexual immorality. So he says there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity We'll talk about that. What is the difference between immorality and impurity? Or of greed. You say, wait a minute. Isn't it okay to have just just be a little greedy from time to time? He says, no, you don't want to do that. Why? Because these are improper for God's holy people. In other words, they don't demonstrate God's presence in our lives. And it says, also it goes on a step further. It says, nor should there be obscenity foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. And for this, you can be sure, no immoral, impure, greedy person, such as a such a man is an idolater. And has do they have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? 
Do you just live your life like this? You just live your life in open immorality, impurity, greed, obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking. Uh, if that's the way you live your life, if that's the way you are in public, if that's the way you are in your walk in this world, there's no demonstrable evidence that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. And he says, when you act like that, there's obviously no inheritance in the kingdom for such people. He talks about that in other places, but that's another message and another lesson for us to learn. What he does give us here is learning to walk in holiness. He gives us uh, two elements within the concept of walking in holiness. He says, number one, let's walk in holiness in the way we act. In other words, our behavior. How do we act? Three things he said there before. <clears throat> he said, first of all, <coughs> let there not even be a hint of sexual immorality. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul uses this again. I'm using a different translation, but he says, flee from immorality. Now, this word immorality, as I said before, is a direct reference to sexual <coughs> sin, sexual immorality. He says, every other sin that man commits lies outside the body, okay? But the immoral man sins against his own body. This sexual sin is against your own body. Do you not know that your body is the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit? Who is within you? The Spirit whom you have from God? <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> when you look at this, he says, <clears throat> when you engage in Sexual immorality. <clears throat> All the other sins that we commit, they're outside. But when we commit sexual immorality, <clears throat> we have committed sins against our own body. We have committed sins against the essence of who we are. You know, I had a, a mother call me years ago and she came home and found her young son, not too young, but found her son lying in bed with a young lady. And of course, they were engaged in sexual intercourse and she was just devastated by it. Sent the girl home, called me like I'm going to do something about it. So that was back in the days when I didn't have two nickels to rub together and I rode around mostly on a motorcycle. So I grabbed my spare helmet, went over there, picked this young man up, put his helmet on him, never said a word to him there, never said nothing in front of the mother. I said, come on, we're going for a ride. And I took him and it just happened to be the week of the York Fair. So I took him up to the York Fair. <clears throat> and I know he was wondering, when are you going to confront me with this? And he had been in our church. <clears throat> and I had talked with him and uh, at other times about things and discipled him and, and taught him from the Word of God. But in this particular instance, I never said a word to him. Finally, we got up and we walked around the fairground, saw all kinds of things, looked at stuff, laughed. I pointed out things. He pointed out things. Then we went over and got uh, an ice cream or something, and we sat down on a bench. And as we're sitting there on the bench, I said, Do you remember that I taught you that the Holy Spirit lives within you? When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit lives within you from that point on. I said, do you remember that? He said, yes, sir. I said, did you realize that you drugged the Holy Spirit into that bed with you this morning with that young lady? And he sat on the bench and he began to weep. That was all I had to say. I have to point out anything else. I just wanted him to understand what he had done. In this concept, he says, flee from immorality. Don't even let there be a hint of sexual immorality in your life. Now, I know that <clears throat> in the environment and the world in which we live, sexual immorality has crept into the hearts and the lives of almost every person. But we need to learn as believers in Jesus Christ to flee from it. The second word that he used, he said, or of any kind of impurity. Now, impurity is different from sexual immorality. <clears throat> sexual immorality is the actual physical acts of engaging in some type of uh, lewd sexual behavior, whether it be adultery or 
uh, premarital sex or anything related to that. Impurity is different in that impurity has to do with anything <clears throat> that defiles us or ruins our testimony, okay? And that is the essence of impurity. In this passage in Philippians chapter 1, the scripture says, I pray that your love, here we talked about love, I pray that your love will keep on growing more and more together with true knowledge and perfect judgment. In other words, we need love. We need to know the word of knowledge. We need to have good judgment. He says, so that you will be able to choose what is best. You see, impurity is when we defile ourselves by choosing those things that are not right, choosing those things that are wrong, whether they be sexual or otherwise, they make us impure. When we begin to choose what is best, and I like the use of that term, what is best? Sometimes we're faced with choices. Sometimes it's a good choice versus a good choice, but which one is best? And in that context, he says, choose what is best. Love grow in knowledge, have good judgment, and then choose what is best. He says, then, then you will be free from all impurity. You see that? Then you'll be free from all impurity and any blame on the day of Christ. There's absolutely nothing that will face you in your life. And so flee immorality, get yourself free from impurity, don't have any kind of impurity. That's the reason it says any kind, because it's not just sexual. It can be any impurity that we've brought upon ourselves. And then he uses a third word, like this is something that is different. Uh, greed. He says greed. He says you don't want to be caught up in any kind of greed. Now greed has a word, uh, that biblical word we should say, in the Bible, it's called covetousness. It's in the original Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. You have heard that before? Well, we covet, we greed, we're greedy by nature. We've got to have what everybody else has. We have to get what we see. That's what leads to thievery. It's what leads to robbery. It's what leads to deception. We understand that we're not supposed to be greedy. And Jesus himself taught this biblical principle when he was teaching here on earth. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, watch out. Watch out. Be on your guard. See, this is something we have to be on our guard about. He said, well, I know to be on my guard about moral impurity. I know to be on uh, moral, immoral life and, and impurity. I know about those things, but are you on guard against all kinds of greed? <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of different types of greed. You can be greedy for things. You can be greedy for money. You can be greedy for an, a position or power. You can be greedy in any number of ways. But it says, be on guard against all kinds of greeds. And then Jesus makes this observation. He says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Very important thing. So we need to be holy in the way we act, not engaged in immorality, not allowing ourselves to be drug into acts or elements of impurity, and certainly not caught up in different kinds of greed that come our way. And they are all temptations that we face. So what we're doing is we're actually learning to have victory over temptations in our life and learning to make the best choices, as we talked about. So, when we're learning to walk in holiness, it depends on the way we act, but it also depends on the things we say. When you looked into that, he said, there should not be any obscenity. In other words, we're not using foul or filthy language. We're not cursing. Uh, we are not engaged in that type of talk. We're not engaged in foolish talk that which is not helpful to anyone, and we're not engaged in coarse joking. You know, sometimes people get caught up in that, especially at work when you're around it all the time. At work, everybody cusses. Why don't I cuss? At work, you know, everybody is talking like fools, and then at work, everybody is telling coarse or rude or crude jokes and things. You don't have to be engaged in that. He says, we need to be holy in the things 
that we say. If you were to understand from the scriptures, we look at the word profanity or profane. Anything that is profane or any words that are profanity, the scripture gives us a definition of what that word profane means. It means that which is not allowed in the temple. And what did we just talk about? The Holy Spirit lives within us. There's no room for profanity in the life of a believer. We need to be careful about the things that we say. Here in this passage in Ephesians 4 that we looked at last week, it says, don't use foul or abusive language. Don't do it. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Very important biblical principle. In James, he noted the essence of what was being said here. He says, you know, don't use obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking. They're out of place, but rather have words of thanksgiving. But James said this about our mouth. He said, words of thanksgiving and cursing, profanity, pour out from the same mouth. He says, my friends, this should not happen. In other words, this is not characteristic of a believer. So we want to learn to walk in love. We want to learn to walk in holiness, not just in the way we act, but also in the things that we say. Now, with this in mind, looking at holiness, Paul says there are two great enemies of walking in holiness. Here they are. Number one, listening to empty words. Uh, the scripture says here in verses six and seven, let no one deceive you with empty words. The word there for empty is sometimes translated vain, but the word vain means empty, useless, false, that which is untrue. And so we have empty words. Why? Because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. You see, empty words are the words that lead us down paths that change the way we act, change the way we think, change the way we talk. So don't let anyone deceive you with vain and empty words. And they'll tell you things like, it's okay, it's okay to say something, it's okay to do this, God will forgive you. Let me tell you something. Don't be deceived. It says such things, it's because of such things that God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Now, who are those who are disobedient? Those who have never received Christ. Those who have openly rejected Jesus. Those who have openly said, I don't want anything to do with you, Jesus. I don't want anything to do with the Bible. I don't want anything to do with God. Those are the ones who are disobedient. And such empty words that they speak or what brings God's wrath in the future on them. He says, therefore, and adds this little statement, do not be partners with them. The implication being, when you're hanging around people who are unbelievers, don't let their empty words deceive you. Don't let them lead you down a path that is destructive by nature. Don't let them corner you into becoming something that you know is not what God would intend for you to be. And so then he adds this, do not be partners with them, which leads me to the second enemy of walking in holiness is associating with evil people. And I'm not talking about working beside somebody. You can't help that. You're to be a light and a witness unto them, but you don't need to go down their path and you don't need to acquiesce to their ideas, philosophies, and their behavior. And they pat you on the back and say, come on, we're going to go do this, we're going to do that. Just say, thank you for inviting me, but I'm not really going to be able to do that today. And just be kind and gracious and excuse yourself and don't associate with evil people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, Paul wrote, Now, what I meant was that you should not associate with people who call themselves brothers or sisters in the Christian faith but live in sexual sin, are greedy, worship false gods, use abusive language, get drunk or dishonest. Don't even eat with people like that, he says. Don't, don't engage. You don't need to associate with people like that. 
I've seen a many a believer go down that path where they they got into uh, things that were greedy. They got into sexual sin. They started changing the way they talk and they used abusive or, or critical language and they were gossips and or they used cursing all the time. They decided that getting drunk and drinking alcohol was more important than saving, having a good testimony for God. Or worse of all, they're dishonest. They lie about things in their life. He says, don't hang out with people like that. Don't associate with that. Especially those who call themselves Christians don't get involved. Why? Because they become the enemy of you learning to walk in holiness. Walk with those who are doing their best to walk the walk. I don't mean they're perfect. Every one of us slips up from time to time. But when we repent, change, when we go back and change our thoughts and our minds, then we begin to walk in that holiness again. We walk in love. We walk in holiness. In this great chapter 5, we see one third way that you and I can be like God. Learn to walk in light. Learn to walk in light. The Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world. Light came into the world. And so we need to learn to walk in light. In verses 8 through 11, it says, You... For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. He doesn't say you're in the light. He says you are light. And it's important for us to walk at it. He says, because we are light in the Lord, live as children of light. In other words, walk like you're light. And then he says, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. And so when we look at this aspect of walking in the light, how do I recognize children of light? How can I see it in me and how can I see it in others? He gives us in this passage that I've just looked at four examples. First of all, when I look at how to recognize children of light, they bear the fruit of light in their character. He says, live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists in three things, all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Goodness is how we treat other people. We are good to them. We are kind to them. We are gracious to them. Righteousness has to do with following and doing our best to do what is right in God's eyes. We are righteous because we have been given this great forgiveness and atonement from Jesus Christ, but we should learn to live like that, walk in that. And then truth. We walk in the truth. We have this fruit of light in our lives. We live for truth. We understand truth. We hunger for truth. We want truth in our lives. And so when you and I are walking in light, we bear the fruit of light in our character. In other words, it becomes a part of who we are. It's not just something that uh, occasionally manifests itself. It becomes a part of our very existence. So how do I recognize a child of light? They bear the fruit of light in their character. The second thing he says about them is that they invest their lives discovering what pleases God. He says, live as children of light and find out what pleases the Lord. They invest their lives discovering what pleases God. They're more interested in what God wants them to do than what anyone else wants them to do. They invest their lives discovering the things that please God, and that's important. We know some things please God greatly, like spending time in worship, reading his word, studying, listening tonight as you are to learn and grow. And we know that he wants us to be gracious and kind and loving to others. He, we know that he wants us to share the good news of Jesus Christ all around us. We know that he wants us to love, be holy, be pure in our life and our walk. We know these things, but you have to discover them because they don't happen just like that when you accept Jesus Christ. So how do I look at myself and walk in the light? Well, first of all, I let that 
light and the things that he is doing in my life become a part of my personal character, goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then I'll invest my life in discovering what pleases God. Then a third thing he mentions here. They separate themselves from evil actions. He says here, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. He says they're fruitless. Why? Because they're not going to get you to heaven. They're the exact opposite of the things that God is looking for in a believer. They are no fruit to you. They will not bear fruit in your life, but God's Holy Spirit will bear fruit in your life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, and temperance. Those are the things that God wants to grow in your life. Well, you have to learn to separate yourselves from evil actions. Very important that we do that. That's how the people know we are children of light. We separate ourselves from evil actions. And then the last thing it says is this. They expose the evil actions of the world. He said, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Now, over the years, I have noted a great number of different individuals in different ways, mindsets, ideas, different maturity levels, different understanding of the Word of God. They run out there and they want to expose the sin of everyone else. And they'll real quickly run out and point a finger at you and tell you everything that's wrong in your life. You met those people? There has to be a better way. How should we expose evil? Well, thankfully, in this passage of Scripture, right after Paul says, expose this evil, expose them, he tells us how to do it. He tells us how to do it. First of all, by setting a godly example. How do you and I expose evil in the world around us? Do we point a finger and say, that's evil, that's horrible, that's terrible, and you're going to hell? Is that the way we do it? No. We set a godly example. Look at this. He says, it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. We don't need to be talking about it. We don't need to glamorize it or, or talk about it and everything that's going on. He says this, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. Why? For it is light that makes everything visible. There would be no understanding that these things are evil, that these things are ungodly, if there was no light. You see, darkness is the absence of light. Darkness is the absence of light. And so you and I are light. Isn't that what it said? He said, you were once darkness, but now you are light. We are light. His light dwells within us. Just as Jesus is the light of the world, he said, we are the light of the world. And our message is the light of the world. And we should not hide it under a bushel. We should not put it away and never bring it forth. I tell folks all the time, there's no such thing as secret agent Christians. You're either publicly a Christian or you're not. Because Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. And so if you're a Christian, start acting like it. And in the context of that, he says, light is what makes everything visible. People hide from darkness. Uh, we looked this morning's devotion that I sent out. We were talking about this very aspect and how that the scripture tells us in John chapter 3 that here's the verdict, that light came into the world and people love darkness rather than light. Why? Because the light exposes their sin. But light makes everything visible. You and I need to be light in our world around us. We need to set a good example, a godly example. We need to live and let Christ shine in us. That's what this Old Testament passage that's quoted here says. That's why it says, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead. That's what happened to me when I received Christ so many years ago when I was 13 years old and I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I rose from the dead. 
uh, spiritually at that moment. And it says, and Christ will shine on you, and I am a reflection of that light. And so live a godly example to the best of your abilities with his help. Second thing he says, by living wisely. If you want to understand wisdom, you're going to have to look into the scriptures. Uh, In the New Testament, a great book of wisdom is the book of James. In the Old Testament, a book of wisdom is the book of Proverbs. There is wisdom that is interdispersed throughout the entirety of the Word of God, but you can look at these two books specifically and look at the wisdom that is offered to you and I from God and from His Word. In the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, it is referred to as a beautiful lady, this lady wisdom. You need to learn all you can about wisdom. You need to apply this wisdom. You need to walk in this wisdom. In the New Testament in James, he said, if any of you lack wisdom, ask God and he will provide it. So we need to learn to live wisely. And that's exactly what he says in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 5. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Now, the wisdom that he's referring to is God's wisdom, not the world's wisdom, but God's wisdom. And we make the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil that are around us. So we need to learn to not only set a godly example, that's how we expose evil, but we also live wisely. We don't live arrogantly or proud. We don't live in that context. We live wisely, understanding God and his word. Then the next thing he says is you expose evil by knowing God's will. See, if you don't know God's will, you get caught up in it. There are Christians today who are walking in states of confusion. They don't understand Why would God allow this? Why is this? You know, and there are those that are going through moments of of great confusion about sexual identity, and they call themselves believers in Christ. And and we look at other elements. They're, They're looking at theology, and they're confused. You need to understand what God's will is. And here in this passage in Ephesians 5, Paul says that. He says, do not be foolish. In other words, because if you're going to set a godly example and you're going to live wisely, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. What is God's will? Well, God's will is discovered in God's word. Very important. Just very simple. You've got to be studying God's word. I've had so many people that have developed concepts and ideas and theological perspectives that when they say them to me, I just go, hmm, did you know that that's not found in the Word of God? Sometimes people actually say to me, I don't care. It's what I choose to believe. Well, I've got news for you. If you just pick and choose the things that you want to believe in the Bible, you're in trouble. Because the Bible tells us very clearly, let God be true and all men liars. And so if you're going to trust yourself rather than trust God in his word, you don't have any right to call yourself a Christian. You don't have any right to call yourself a believer in God because you just made yourself the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And so we understand that knowing what the Lord's will is, is significant. Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. God's will is not indiscernible. God's will is very clear in His Word. And so you got to get into the Word. We expose evil by setting a godly example. We expose evil by living wisely, and we expose evil by knowing God's will. All right? Last thing he says is this. We expose evil by being filled with the Holy Spirit. That word filled, pleru, means to be filled to overflowing. It was the word that that, uh, Jesus used when 
He told the disciples to cast their net on the other side after they haven't caught anything during the night. And so they relinquished and threw the net on the other side. And the Bible said that it was filled, pleru, to the point where the net was ready to break and it was almost more than they could get into the boat. That's the word. You and I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he gives us this aspect of understanding it. He says, do not get drunk on wine. And that means don't get drunk on any alcoholic beverage. Don't get drunk, which leads to, guess what? Debauchery. Debauchery is when you lose your inhibitions and you do things and say things you wish you had never said or done, or you get into aspects where your thought life is not appropriate. Your, your senses are not clear. Do you know how many people I've buried who were under the influence of drugs and alcohol? They died as a result of that particular experience in their life. They OD'd or they got involved in an accident uh, and they were killed as a result of that drunkenness. He says, don't be like that. That's not who we are. And you do not expose evil by living like that. Instead, he says, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another. And here's the key. How do I know I'm filled with the Spirit? Speak to one another with psalms. Psalms are scripture verses that are sung. There are passages of scripture that are sung. They can be contemporary. They can be old. They can be in the Bible they, uh, from the Old Testament or New Testament. It doesn't make any difference. Psalms, hymns. Hymns are songs that teach wondrous truths and the aspects of, of understanding God's word with greater fervor. And so we have psalms and hymns and then spiritual songs. Spiritual songs are those songs that reflect praise and are born in the heart of those who have been through experiences in life where they bring those things to bear that we would truly understand their heart and their love and their praise for God. And so do that. Speak to one another. And then he says, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. So it's not just something that we physically do in church. It's also something that we do in our spirit, something within our heart. And then he says this, one of the key characteristics of being filled with the Spirit is always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means I'm filled with the Spirit when I live with an attitude of gratitude. It's just one of the natural outpourings of the Holy Spirit. We are thankful and grateful for anything and everything that takes place in our life. Paul the Apostle said, Be anxious of nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Many, many years ago, over 40 years ago, I held my son in my arms as he drew his last breath. And the only words that could come to my heart and mind at that time were these. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. Can you have an attitude of gratitude at the darkest moments in your life? That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your kindness and love. We thank you for the rich blessings that you bestow upon us. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit, ever present to guide and direct us, helping us to walk in love, helping us to walk in holiness, and helping us to walk as light. Lord, I pray that your blessings would rest upon your people and that you would encourage them beyond measure. Now, dear friend, if you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I don't know for certain if I died that I'd go to heaven, but I want to know. I need to know. Dear friend, the scripture says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus 
and believe in their heart that God the Father raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Would you like to receive Jesus tonight? Would you like to be forgiven of your sin and have a home in heaven one day? If you would, just bow your head right now with me and follow me in a real simple prayer. Will you do that? Let's pray. Just say, Lord Jesus, I want to be forgiven of my sin. And I want to have a home in heaven one day with you. I don't want to fear death. And so, Lord Jesus, I'm going to place my faith and my future in your hands, believing that you died on the cross and shed your precious blood to forgive me of all my sin, past, present, and future. And I believe that when they took you down from that cross after you drew your last breath of life, they laid you in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, you gloriously and miraculously rose from the dead, And if you have the power to do that, you have the power to give me a home in heaven one day with you. So Lord Jesus, will you please come into my heart and my life? Will you be my Savior to forgive me, to wash me white as snow, to take away all my guilt and shame? Will you be my Lord to lead me, to help me walk in love and in holiness and as light, to make good and wise decisions? to choose that which is best. And will you be my friend to stand beside me no matter what I experience in this life and one day walk the streets of heaven with you? Thank you for saving me, Lord Jesus. And dear one, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. And we praise God for that. Maybe you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior tonight. Share it with someone. If you don't have anyone you can share that with, drop a note to me there at Pastor Howard at familyofgodcc.com. I would truly love to hear from you. Dear friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon you to watch over you, no matter where you go. And as we leave this time together, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. As always, dear friends, keep looking up.